This week, Australia's Bureau of Meteorology formally declared that the global climate driver, known as El Nino, is underway. El Nino is a warming of the central and eastern southern Pacific Ocean and is part of a larger natural oscillation across this part of the world that reoccurs a number of times each decade. In this WeatherSnap Climate Special, I talked to Ziweng Chua, climatologist with the Bureau of Meteorology. He describes the coming together of different weather patterns and how they may influence Australia's weather in the coming months. For the Bureau of Meteorology, we look at both the atmosphere and ocean. The atmosphere and ocean is uh, part of El Nino. Um, well, El Nino takes into account both atmosphere and ocean. And we noticed that the ocean was uh, clearly or firmly exhibiting signs of El Nino since at least July, if not earlier, but the atmosphere was slower to respond. But recently, we have started to see the atmosphere respond more clearly to the warm sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. And one of these indicators that we saw had a shift was the pressure pattern. We start to see you know, a clear pattern of lower than average pressure in the eastern Pacific and higher than average pressure in the western Pacific, uh, which is uh, indicative or associated with El Nino. And then one of the indexes we use is the Southern Oscillation Index. And this went into El Nino territory recently, so during August. And even though it did go into El Nino territory in May, uh, that was short-lived or temporary, but this time it's gone back into El Nino and we believe that it's there to stick around in the El Nino territory now. That's interesting. So you're looking for evidence. So it's not just sea surface temperature localized across the eastern side of the South Pacific. It's far more than that. And so you just want rigorous evidence that you're actually going into an event like this. I think, yeah, other agencies also look at the atmosphere too, but there's probably some variations in the strength and maybe longevity of indicators between agencies. So these variations can lead to differences in, I guess, declaration, especially when El Nino is in its early stages or quite weak, which was the case during winter, I believe. And because Australia is more directly impacted by an El Nino event, you have to be sure because the impacts can be broad, extensive and sometimes intensive. So let me just now ask you, we're talking in September, we'll talk in a moment about your temperatures through the first half of September. But tell me, um, as you go through spring and into summer, what type of expectation do you have in terms of weather and how it will change and be influenced by this El Nino? Historically with El Nino, we have seen drier than average conditions as well as warmer conditions over Eastern Australia as well, or especially over Southeast Australia. And this, we, we do see this uh, historical association reflected in our current long range forecast too, uh, which is important because each El Nino event would be different or uh, just because there's no guarantee that these dry and warm conditions will eventuate, but we do see them in the forecast for uh, this current event. That's also or probably in part also to the positive Indian Ocean dipole So I think that's being reflected in the long range forecast as well. Well, let's talk about that now, because it was almost a joint announcement that there is a positive Indian dipole. For those who are listening who are not familiar with this phrase, could you explain what it is, please? Yeah, it's good that I think uh, we you bring this up or we can talk about this, Claire, because I think it's just, you know, as you know, equal amount of attention should be given to this uh, other driver, the positive Indian Ocean dipole, which is a climate driver that happens over the Indian Ocean. It is similar in concept to the Pacific Ocean in that they are driven by changes in uh, the sea surface temperature on either side of the ocean. But in this case, with the positive Indian Ocean dipole, there's cooler water over the eastern Indian Ocean and then warmer water over the western Indian Ocean. And that changes the circulation patterns in the atmosphere that lead to decreased rainfall over Australia, especially central Australia and southern Australia, as well as warmer conditions as well. So this reinforces what an El Nino could do. Um, I presume they don't work together all the time. One isn't because of the other. Or is there an influence? You're right in that saying that just because one of them happens, it's no guarantee the other one will happen, but there is a historical association that they are linked or there's a higher chance of one occurring when the other occurs. 
there is a physical linkage for that as well in just having the warm water on, let's say, the Western Pacific. It can flow through to the Eastern Indian Ocean, um, which, which leads to the El Nino positive Indian Ocean dipole having a correlation to each other. Uh, and you're right in that we do see that when they both happen, the drying and or the dry and warm conditions brought on by each individual driver can be enhanced. And we also see that it's more widespread because um, El Nino tends to affect more of eastern Australia, whereas um, with the Indian Ocean dipole being to the west, that affects central Australia. So now we see, you know, a larger part of Australia being affected by these dry and warm conditions. As a climate scientist and seeing these two events unfolding, what are your main concerns? You've said it's, it could be dry, maybe warmer than average, but can you elaborate on that? For this event, it seems like the signal for warm temperatures or warm maximum temperatures is strong. I think during spring is where we can see a really uh, strong effect from both uh, positive Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino. So the last time we had both of these events occur or when the Bureau declared El Nino and positive Indian Ocean Dipole was in 2015. And in 2015, during that spring, it was uh, very warm. So it was our third warmest spring on record. Uh, even though the Bureau didn't declare El Nino in uh, 2019 or 2018 to 2019, that was a weak or marginal borderline El Nino event, which uh, was declared by some other agencies. And we did see a strong positive Indian Ocean dipole that year too. And in that year, that summer, when both of these drivers were uh, active or in play, we had our warmest summer on, on record. And in the second half of 2018, uh, conditions were really dry. We saw yeah, conditions being um, driest on record for some parts of Australia, but even large parts being in the bottom 10% of the historical record. So we have had, uh, I guess, historical events when these two drivers have been in play. Uh, we have seen quite extreme heat as well as uh, dry conditions. I think in this event, the current forecast um, is the temperature signal that is standing out uh, the strongest. There is a, a drier than average or drier forecast, but that is a bit more patchy than the temperature forecasts where we see you know, all of Australia being warmer than average. So I presume you work with other agencies, in particular, one of the, the main impacts that makes international news are the wildfires. And preparing for such an event is something which must be paramount. It's a very difficult uh, or complex hazard to manage, um, but... Uh, the Bureau does work with um, state and national agencies in trying to manage the risk, as well as also have embedded uh, staff into these fire agencies to help out with those forecasts too. In terms of bushfire risk, we have had a few years of weather than average weather, which does lead to a different landscape in that, you know, there's a bit more moisture around. But, you know, we also had a, a quite a dry winter so far. So we've seen this moisture start to dry out. And there are some areas where um, there definitely are some increased risks of bushfires. And yeah, these have been, I guess, identified and now we're working to try and manage it. But yeah, the recent weather, we've already seen yeah, some dangerous fire kind of risks already. Now here in the UK, we began September with some incredibly high temperatures for our autumn. In some places, records were broken. But you've experienced similar things in Australia as you entered your springtime. We, you know, we came off a record uh, winter, so it's the warmest winter on record for Australia. And then even since uh, September or start of September, we've been seeing quite exceptional heat uh, so far over, mm, I guess, southern half of Australia, with parts of southeast Australia being highest on record so far for September. So we've seen that heat continue and um, the forecasts indicate that, you know, we still continue to see these unusually uh, warm conditions into spring and possibly or likely into early summer too. And El Nino doesn't last just a week or a month, does it? No. So they usually last um, several months. And with uh, this current event, the model suggests that it will last until at least the end of February, uh, if not longer. And yeah, it's great to collaborate and talk to international agencies, especially on such global phenomena and uh, such a really warm year we're having so far. is. Um, yeah, we've seen a lot of record heat, so good to keep in touch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Zi Wang Chua, Senior Climatologist with the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. 
That's it for this edition of Weathersnap. I'm Claire Lazier. Thanks for listening. Another great weather snap, Claire. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to hit subscribe. Then you catch all of our daily weathers on YouTube as well. And if podcasts are your thing, check out our Met Office podcast channel. Lots of information, lots of stories there. And we'll see you again next week.